Welcome back, everyone. I uh, hope you enjoyed the short break. Uh, we're very excited to have Professor Jeff Fessler give a hands-on uh, interactive session on the Michigan Image Reconstruction Toolbox with Julia. And I'm told that you can participate and follow along if you install uh, the, the tools directly, but you can also just listen in. So I'll hand it off to Jeff now. Okay. Thank you very much for that introduction. If you uh, go to the schedule for this, the timetable for this meeting, uh, there's a link here uh, that you could click on if you want to uh, really follow along on your own screen with things. So thank you very much for inviting me to participate in this. Here is the obligatory disclosures, and which I have none, and uh, copyright and license issues. Um, I'm really pleased to be part of this workshop because I've been promoting you know, open source software and reproducibility for more than 20 years. Basically, not long after the, it became possible to share stuff on the World Wide Web in the late 90s, uh, I started sharing code on my website. Um, and in fact, um, I have a reproducible research page uh, that has many of my students' papers, uh, the code and data that goes with us. And I was just scrolling, goes back to 2002. So about 20 years of doing this. Um, but I think it's fair to say that up until relatively recently, I've been doing this with 20 year old technology, which is I've been sharing the Michigan image reconstruction toolbox in a zipped tar file ever since the days that I started doing that. Um, and it's kind of a mess because it includes a ton of code uh, and it also includes some data. It includes compiled MEX files for some architectures and not others. So. Uh, lots of people have used it, don't get me wrong, but it's it's not the modern way to share things. And so what I hope to convey to you today is uh, uh, actually three or depending on how you count, four different versions of the Michigan Image Reconstruction Toolbox um, that are moving in more modern directions, okay? Um, let me see here. For those, I, I will skip for those of you who might be interested only in Python to mention there is a growing collection of Python Michigan in, uh, image reconstruction tools called MerTorch because it's uh, built on top of uh, PyTorch. And so if you're interested in Python, you can uh, do a screen grab here. I, I guess I could post, maybe I'll post this link in the chat real quick here for those of you who are interested because I, I, I recognize that the community, a lot of people are using Python. That's all I'm gonna say about that, but the, the principles of, I, of what I'm gonna discuss in Julia especially, also apply pretty well to the Python code as well. Um, if you're following along, the first thing to do is to go to julialang.org if you really wanna do this in real time uh, and click the download button and pick out your architecture and download it and install it. I'm actually gonna walk through that part because I think everybody knows how to install apps on their computer. Um, once you've installed it, you'll see the Julia icon uh, somewhere in an app. You know, it looks like these three colored circles here. And you double click to launch that icon and you'll get, actually, let me do that. Let me just switch square, switch sharing for a second here to um, to show you what it looks like to make it less opaque. I'm gonna temporarily share my whole screen here. All and right. feel free to, to unmute yourselves and, you know. Right, absolutely. Yeah, I, I, I have very few slides and a lot of things I'm going to show you on my screen. So it'd be most enjoyable for me to answer questions and whatever as we go along. So uh, you, if you install it by default, it'll go in your applications folder. I have a freeware folder, so it's in my freeware folder here. And so if I double click my Julia icon, um, I get uh, what well, looks very old school, except for the colors, perhaps, you know, plain text sort of thing. This is actually how I run MATLAB too. When I, when I start MATLAB, all I get is, a, is an X, X term. <laughs> um, and, I, and I do my MATLAB typing in that X term, which I realize is very old school. And I can do the same thing at a Julia. This is called a REPL. I forget where uh, run, execute, something, something. It's, it's the interactive place where you can, you know, do things that you do with interactive programming languages. So already you're seeing that, that Julia is like Python and MATLAB in the sense that it's um, a dynamically typed language that you're, you're you know, creating variables interacting on the fly. 
Uh, so here is here is an example that already illustrates something neat about um, Julia. So this this statement here has just created an array that consists of two things: a string and a number and the number nine. And uh, so there's no need for something like a cell array in MATLAB, right? MATLAB started with numerical arrays, and later they wanted to collect other kinds of things together. And so they created created the cell type. But in Julia, an array is a first class type that can hold anything, including including things of what you might think of as different types, right? Strings and numbers and so on. And you can you index uh, into that array just like you would index in pretty much every language except MATLAB, right? In MATLAB, you use parentheses for indexing in Julia and Python and C, you index using square, square brackets, which I think is much more intuitive. So you know that you're doing indexing as opposed to calling a function, which is ambiguous in, in MATLAB. Um, okay, so that's a quick demo of the, the REPL where I do a lot of my work. Now, I in the instructions, I encourage you to install VS Code and use it as a full featured uh, development environment for whatever language you're using. Uh, I'm still old school. I pretty much use Vim most of the time, but for those of you who are younger than me, you want to use a more powerful editor, I'm sure. Uh, let me switch shares back to the browser now. Uh, sorry, where I've got too many windows open and not that one. Okay, this one, here we go. <laughs> All right, so let me, I am going to be talking a lot about Julia. Uh, here again are the, the main links relative to this um, presentation. So let me tell you why I'm focusing on Julia and why several students in my group have switched to using Julia, but in full disclosure, there's quite a few that still use MATLAB and there's quite a few that use Python. So all of the different versions of MERT are, <laughs> are being used in, in my group. So if you look back at the, um, I think at least the first two presentations in the, the sister session that began this, um, both of them referred to, in both BART and uh, Gadgetron, they referred to underlying code that was written in C or C++, and then an interface on top of that through Python or MATLAB. And that's what's known as the two language problem, that if you want efficiency, traditionally, you need to write your code in a compiled language like C or C++, but then if you want interactivity and convenience of use, you want Python or MATLAB type language, a dynamically type language specifically, uh, for those interactive activities. And Julia was really designed for scientific computing to solve that so-called two language problem because under the hood, uh, Julia is compiled using the LLVM compiler, which is state-of-the-art compiler. But as you just saw in my little example, you interact with it. You're not aware there's a compiler under the hood. That, that, that statement that I typed there of, of creating an array that was, had a couple elements in it, that was actually being compiled as I said it or as I typed it. And uh, see, so the real, one of the real reasons I love Julia is that I'm getting the performance of a compiled language. In fact, in MATLAB, as you know, you go to great lengths to avoid writing loops because those tend to be slow. It's perfectly fine if you want to write loops in Julia because they'll be compiled and they'll, they'll execute uh, quickly, very similar to if you write a loop in any you know, compiled language. Um, but unlike traditional compiled languages like C or C++, uh, which aren't interactive, you know, this, this is the experience of it is, is like using Python or MATLAB, right? You're, you're interacting at a, at a REPL and so you have dynamic variable typing um, and, and the things that go with that. And, and if you like to work in an environment like a Jupyter Notebook, you have that option. The JU in Jupyter, in fact, stands for Ju Julia, the PY for Python and the R for the R statistics language. What I, uh, one of the reasons I really like Julia is that the syntax of the language was designed to match linear algebra uh, and mathematics. Um, and MATLAB is the same to some degree, but Python is not, right? Python was written as a general purpose language first, and then people added numerical programming uh, packages after it. And you have some pretty awkward syntax that results because of that add numerical programming being add on. If you love it, that's great. But I really like, and I grew, I've been using MATLAB for 30 years. I like the MATLAB like syntax, Y equals A times X written in, you know, A asterisk X. And Julia inherits that kind of natural mathematical representation. Uh, one thing I struggled with in 30 years of using MATLAB and, and, and sharing code online is that MATLAB, at least until relatively recently, lacked the ability to have namespace control. 
They added that eventually, but way too late for me. I had 100,000 lines of MATLAB already at the point they added that. And it would have broken too many things to, to start exploiting that. And there were many times over the course of the years of me distributing my, my MATLAB, the MERT, the MATLAB-based um, image reconstruction package, that MATLAB would add a new function to the, one of their packages that would conflict with the name of one of my functions. And then I'd have to go rewrite things. You'll notice the more recent version, there's a lot of function names that are prefixed with IR underscore, because I was trying to, to make sure that I wouldn't conflict with MATLAB functions with similar names. So Julia, like Python, has complete namespace control. So uh, by using statements like using an import, and you'll see that in the examples that I'm showing you. And so it uh, avoids that problem that I had in years of working with MATLAB. Under the hood, um, the libraries that you're used to using in both MATLAB and Python are also being used in library. The linear algebra packages, the FFTW package. So the speed of those kinds of library calls is identical basically because you're uh, actually it might be faster in Julia because you're um, passing by by reference whereas MATLAB makes a lot of copies of things when you're calling uh, certainly when you're calling MEX files I'm less sure about when you're calling these libraries um, so this conference reproducibility is a major theme and Julia has the best uh, uh, infrastructure for reproducibility that I've experienced yet so associated with code that you release in Julia you can include what's called a manifest that shows the exact versions of the libraries that were used at the time you you know wrote the code that you that you put in a certain paper so and the reason for it is that the whole thing the whole infrastructure is built on git and as those of you who used git know it there's you know everything that you do is tagged uh, and and so those you can write a paper where you used an ex particular version of a library at a certain time and then years later somebody can go use exactly that version because they'll basically be pulling the Git repository automatically, Julia will take care of this for you using the manifest um, that was there at the time you wrote the paper. So I, I bragged a second ago about having 20 years of MATLAB code on my, or, or examples on my website, but the reality is a lot of that is not so reproducible because I've had to change functions in my library from the time those papers were written 10, 15 years ago. And there's, there's and without version control, you really can't go back in time. Uh, but with, with the way Julia is built on top of Git, you really have excellent reproducibility. Um, and it's free, okay, and open source. It's open source in a way that hundreds of people have contributed to the, the main library itself, including myself. And maybe thousands of people have contributed packages that add on to it, um, including myself. Um, and then there's you know lots of editors that have kind of integrated development environments that are really suitable for using, including nice debuggers. Um, it's a different kind of object-oriented programming than, than you get in, in Python um, in a way that makes it very easy to uh, make use of other people's packages. I won't really have time to explain that in full detail. Um, in MATLAB, you can only have sparse matrices of double precision type. In Julia, you can have sparse precision, sparse matrices of any type, even float 16 types. And this is important for some of the things we do in medical imaging with large data sets. And as I've mentioned already, calling functions is really call by reference. It's something slightly more complicated than that, but that's the simple way to think about it. And so it's, um, you're not uh, making duplicate arrays of things every time you call them. And if you have a favorite library in C or Python that you want to use, there's the ability to call that. So it's very interoperable. So those are the main features that have motivated me. Uh, that I guess the two big ones for me is the performance and the syntax. And well, and the free part, the open source aspect is, is and I've been using it in cl many classes here. There's several universities that are using it even at freshman level classes like Robotics 101 at Michigan and something similar at Stanford. So with that, now let's get into image reconstruction. Anybody have, I see one thing in the chat. Let's see here. Um, oh, that was John just posting a link. Anybody have any questions about Julia before I dig into it a little bit? You'll probably have more questions once they start showing you code, but feel free to stop me at any point. Uh, let's see here. So now timetable. Oh, I do want to mention in terms of the MATLAB version, I would encourage you, especially as the MRI audience, not to download the gzip file anymore. Instead, uh, go to the GitHub version now. 
the only thing that's missing in the GitHub version is there's not all the data, and but we have a, a a way that if you need to access certain data files, it'll automatically go fetch it from a different Git repo. That way, the code repo is kept small. And also, this doesn't include any MEX files, but there is an IR build MEX that will compile the MEX files that are relevant to the MRI audience uh, on your machine and your operating your operating system, your version of MATLAB. So uh, you do have to have a compiler to, to run that. Somebody pointed out to me earlier that not all users have compilers, which I can't imagine anybody using image reconstruction toolbox who doesn't have a compiler, but I got an email about that. So now I'm going to focus on Julia the rest of the time, unless anybody has any specific questions about, um, about the other versions. Um, so what I'm showing you here is what looks to you like a web page. I mean, it is. This is HTML being rendered on, on my screen and being zoomed to you. But I wrote this as a Julia file. Um, well, actually, this particular page, I'm sorry, is actually uh, written as Markdown. So this is Markdown that gets turned into HTML. The code that I'm about to show you, let me, uh, let me just see here. So if you... This is the this is where you then install the language if you if the the app if you want the language and then here's some getting started in, instructions. I'm going to start skipping to actual image reconstruction examples, right? Because that's where the bulk of our time should be. So what I'm showing you now, I'm going to start with a non-uniform fast forward transform because that's a tool my group has distributed for years that lots of people have used. And um, when I first started using Julia, I thought that I would need to port all that code to Julia, but it turns out another group had already written a uh, very nice non-uniform FFT language library. And so I just built a built upon that. So uh, why, don't, why don't I give credit to where credit is due for that? Let me see. So nft.jl from Tobias Knopp, and I've contributed to this repo as well. You can see my avatar there. Um, super nice NUFFT package. It supports uh, multi-threading and, and uh, GPUs, way more features than my MATLAB version supports. So I, what I'm showing you here is built on top of that. Um, so what I did for this is I wrote one Julia file. I'll just click on this and show it to you. Then when you click on that link, it actually shows you exactly where it is in the repo, in the, the Mert Julia version of the repo. And what you'll, so the pound sign is the comment sign in Julia. So the, the lines that start with pound are generally comments for Julia code, or in this case, that also includes a markdown, right? So the, 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 the headings here, for example, are in this Julia code. Um, and then I uh, push this to the cloud and through some configuration in the cloud, GitHub servers automatically convert this uh, into the HTML that you're looking at. They also convert it into a Python, uh, a Jupyter Notebook version that you can, can view if you prefer, if you like to work with Jupyter Notebooks, the same code. And then it actually executes this Julia code and produces this HTML that shows the output, right? So I didn't do anything special to produce all these plots other than write Julia code that makes plots. And then in the cloud, it's automatically making um, what I'm going to be talking about today, that this, this uh, kind of demonstration. And to me, this is the ultimate in sort of reproducibility and code documentation, because what you're seeing here is both the comments, you know, sort of the, the documentation, if you will, well, part of the documentation anyway, the overview of it, the code itself. Um, you could, if you wanted, to cut and paste these lines of codes into the Julia REPL as we speak, if you wanted to. I would say it's probably more natural to download the Julia file and, and include it um, or run it in, in an editor like VS Code, but you, you could just cut and paste these lines. And then, you, you know, as I've been saying here, you can see the actual output. Um, and I've learned a lot of Julia, frankly, by looking at other people's similarly constructed documentation, right? It's very helpful to see the code and the output. I have a fair amount of documentation in my MATLAB version of the toolbox, but there's no graphics to go with it, right? There's just, you know, plain text comments. And I think we're imaging people, right? It's super helpful, I think, to actually see what you're going to get before you start uh, digging into some code and trying to learn what it's all about. Any questions? There was a question from Birkin. Uh, Birkin, I don't know if you want to unmute yourself. And, and yes. Comment. Yeah, I didn't want to interrupt. Yeah, thank you, Jeff, for the talk. Uh, I think one reason 
people have looked at Python recently is, you know, the presence of things like TensorFlow, PyTorch, Keras, et cetera, that makes uh, deep learning type research easier. Right. Uh, can you comment on the presence of such toolboxes in Julia? Is there right. any uh, yep. support in terms of? Uh, well, there are interfaces. You can call those toolbox from Julia. The, Julia has its own. Uh, the, the, the premier one I'd say is called uh, Flux. Uh, is a library that's uh, designed for machine learning that my group has been using for these kinds of things. So uh, because Julia is a compiled language, you don't need to be locked into the particular functions provided by a specific library like whatever's in PyTorch. You can write Julia code. Oh, I should mention Julia code has what's called introspection. I'm not a computer science expert, but it basically has the ability to sort of uh, inspect itself and modify its code. And so therefore people have written auto differentiation tools for Julia that you can auto differentiate anything basically. So you don't have to be limited to whatever functions Google or Facebook provided in those libraries. You can write your own Julia code and then uh, get auto differentiation of it as something that's really built into the nature of the language itself. Uh, but there are also ways to call uh, I haven't used, I haven't used the way I know it's possible, but it's definitely possible to call Python and I've called some simple Python routines. I haven't personally called PyTorch, for example, or um, TensorFlow. Um, I think a lot of people who are Julia true believers like me are probably te tending to use the, the, the Julia native ones. That would be my answer to your question at this point. And I don't have examples of that today. And the reason for that, I mean, I do have students that are doing uh, machine learning based image reconstruction using all Julia, right? Uh, including that library I just showed you. Um, I haven't quite figured out how to make this kind of nice in the cloud demo of those because I'm not sure that the GitHub servers have GPUs on them and I'm not sure they'd appreciate us up uploading demos that take hours of training. There's probably some time limit on how, how long the continuous integration servers can run. So I haven't tried to do this version of it uh, yet. Thanks for the question. I knew I knew somebody was going to ask that, so I appreciate it. So there will not be any machine learning examples in this. Okay, I see some others in the chat. Jonathan, do you want to? I guess I'll I won't uh, just speak up. I'm, I'm monitoring the chat, but I don't see any other questions All right. right now. Yeah. So I mentioned that Julia has full namespace control. So the first thing you have to do, generally, for any real work that you're going to do, is import or or tell Julia, the current Julia session that you're running, which packages you want to use, right? Because otherwise, if you type FFT, which FFT do you want? Well, probably the one in the FFTW package, right? And I'll have an example of that later. And so um, the very first time that you use one of these packages, you kind of need to import it into your workspace. Oh, let me, let me make a higher level comment about that. The way my, the MATLAB version of MERT works it's kind of a kitchen sink right there's pet inspect and ct and mri and regularizers and everything thrown in there and when you download the jit the or or get do a git pull of the the matlab version of mert you get it all and when i first started creating the julia version i kind of took that same approach and then over time realized that because of the way the julia works with github it's actually more convenient to have uh, smaller, more specialized packages. So think of it more like cooking in your kitchen where you where you pick out the specific recipes you need to make a cake or whatever, right? Uh, some specific ingredients you need. And so for this example that I'm gonna show you right here, the ingredients I need, including some phantoms, a Shep Logan kind of phantom, I'm gonna be plotting. I'm, I'm, Julia has the ability through library, through packages like this to actually do things with physical units. And so I wanted to demonstrate that here. I want some pretty strings in my plots. And then uh, I want to display some images. And then I actually will need a few tools from the Mert version of Julia, which is still kind of a, a bit of a kitchen sink at this point, but will over time be kind of separated into more uh, distinct units. Uh, and specifically what I need from Mert here is a, a system operator that does the non-uniform fast Fourier transform, you know, A times X for an NUFFT something that does left finite differences so that I can do total variation like regularization and an iterative algorithm, which in this case is nonlinear conjugate gradient. Now, Julia does not require that you specify which functions out of a given package that you use. I'm doing this because I think it's helpful for me and for other readers of the code when you see 
okay, here's this function gym that's being called here. Where the heck did that come from? Is that built into Julia or did that come from somewhere else? And so if you look at the using statements up here, you can see that that function gym, which stands for Jiffy image display, um, <laughs> Uh, is coming from the Mert Jim package. So again, I wouldn't have to say that. I could have just said using Mert Jim, but I think it makes it much more clear. Also, this is how you get the namespace control. Imagine one of these other packages happened to have a function named Jim. Then you do need to qualify it here so that you know exactly which one you're getting. Uh, you might, some of you have used my MATLAB toolbox might know that there's a, ver a function in there called M and you might wonder why did I change the name of Julia? Well, in, in Julia, IM is the imaginary number, square root of negative one. And so I can't use the, we need that. So I had to use a different name uh, in the Julia version. So this is just a, like I said, Jiffy image display, like very similar to the M in the MATLAB version. Let me see if there's anything else I want to say. So you, you can kind of get a sense from a preview. Just, this is sort of a preview right here of what we're going to be doing, right? Making some phantoms with some units, uh, at some point doing some menu FFT reconstruction and plotting and displaying them. I'll pause here for questions again. I'll ask a quick question. Uh, I think it's it's pretty interesting how the namespaces work. So looking at this, um, one thing I'm that I I'm wondering is is which parts are part of your toolbox versus kind of other packages that have been contributed. Um, so I wrote image phantoms. Uh, I've contributed to Unitful a tiny bit. I wrote Mert Jim and I wrote Mert. So about half of these are you know so. Some of these are mine. You can kind of guess, I guess, the more imaging ones. Um, I don't know if that answers your question. Um, yeah. So it's a very interactive, I mean, it's often the case that uh, because this is all open source, there's a big community of people that are, you know, making pull requests to each other's packages to add the features we need for what we're doing, right? And so, so it's, it's not as black and white as, I wrote this and somebody else wrote that, right? I mean, it, there's there's contribution go, going both ways. All right, so was there another question? Okay, just, just pause me. I speak fast, I know, just pause me at any time if you have questions. So for I thought I would start with radial sampling just as an illustration of a typical non-Cartesian sampling here. All right, so I'm gonna reconstruct an image of size 128 by 128. And here's an example of I don't have to do this. I just wanted to demonstrate it to you guys that we can use physical units. And believe me, I've seen lots of student and my own code where there's factors of 10 floating around because one part's in millimeters and other parts in centimeters. And it, it is there. I'm trying to move towards unit, using units more and more. So that stuff is automatically taken care of and so that we don't get bugs because of being off by factors of 10 or worse. Um, so, so far, this looks a lot like MATLAB code. In fact, uh, even this line, the colon here is a range, just like you would have in MATLAB. Uh, the difference is when you do a range in MATLAB, if you say 1 colon 99, it's actually going to create a, an array it's gonna, with 99 values in memory and double precision by default. In Julia, it actually just store, and like in Python, I believe, it actually just stores a range object. It's basically just storing the start and the end. And then when you actually need to do calculation later, it'll iterate over the over the, the numbers in that range, but it doesn't allocate up. You can have a, a range of a million numbers and it, it's, it's just a, uh, it's more virtual than that, right? It's a special kind of object. Uh, the special divide by sign here is for integer division because I want to divide integers here because I want an integer range of, of uh, you know, samples. Uh, they'll be scaled by my, my radius and K space. Um, let me see, I was gonna, um, I forgot what I was going to say about that. There's one more comment I had here, but I'll just go on and it'll come back to me. I'm, oh yeah, I remember. To get a symbol like this phi, it's very LaTeX-like. At the Julia repo, I type backslash PHI and then hit tab. I could demonstrate that if I switch the view uh, and, and then it turns into the phi. You don't have to do that. You can totally write PHI out if you want, but it kind of makes the code look more like the math if you are so inclined to do that. So to make this divide sign at the REPL type backslash DIV, the, the, the LaTeX code for division. And this is all documented. The Julia uh, manual tells you all those LaTeX codes if you don't know, if you don't, and you don't have to use them, but, and Julia has like other, you know, has 
tab completion kind of, if you don't remember, you could type backslash DI and hit tab and it'll show you the options and you can pick out the one you want. So you'll see a lot of Greek letters and stuff in my code because I'm just taking advantage of that uh, to make it again, look a little more like the math. All right, so I've got radial sampling in case space here. And I've got angular sampling, okay, with a, with a pi there. You can also spell out PI for pi. Uh, and then I want to, uh, at some point, I'm gonna actually need the X and Y frequencies. And so here I'm using a, a, a feature of Julia called broadcast. So in, in MATLAB, if you have a, a vector and you want to apply cosine to every element of the vector, you just type cosine to the variable name. Um, in Julia, you need to tell it that you want to apply cosine to every element of that uh, vector. And so the dot is what tells that. That means apply element wise this function. And that might seem annoying to you at first if you come from MATLAB, like why do I have to type that dot? But that dot becomes incredibly powerful for other things where you have vectors that are lists of objects that you wanna apply the same operation to. And all you have to do is apply that one dot and uh, a more complicated operation than cosine. It also makes things unambiguous. Uh, the square, if you need the square root of a matrix, you, you do square root of A. If you want the element Y square root, you do square root of dot, right? And so you, you can tell as a reader whether this is a, a matrix operation or an element wise operation by the presence of that dot. Okay, so that was a lot of explanation just to get to the first part. And now finally I'm plotting um, uh, the radial case space sampling. And you'll notice that thanks to this package called Unitful Recipes, uh, it automatically labeled, I didn't tell it, right? When I pr produced the label, I just told it I wanted it to be new X and new Y for the, and I'm not using KX and KY here because these are in physical units, you know, maybe K in a digital signal processing sense, it's more like integers, whatever. And, and that thing automatically recognized that this array has units. It has units here that are inverse millimeters because we divided by this pixel spacing right here. Of course, K space is cycles per millimeter, right? So it's showing inverse millimeters here. All right, so that's a plot of our K space sampling. How am I doing on time? Okay, so we'll, we'll get to some reconstruction in a minute. Um, now, the way my NUFFT interface works here is I actually want units of radians per pixel. And so I'm converting to radians per pixel here. So here's another plot where we go from minus pi to pi. Uh, and now I'm creating a Shep Logan Phantom here. You know, uh, there's different flavors of Shep Logan Phantoms. You don't want the CT one when you're working with MRI data. And here I'm computing its spectrum, which is actually a function. And then that function can be evaluated at the, at the case space locations in the appropriate units. Um, this Shep Logan Phantom actually has units in its dimensions. Uh, and again, this dot means element wise. This is a function I'm applying elements wise to all of the X and Y K space frequency locations. And now I have K space data. And now I'm displaying the K space data in polar coordinates here, um, uh, radial and angular coordinates, coordinates. And not everything yet supports units. So at this point, I gave up on the units and I've normalized the data divided by its units. Um, because I think the FFT library doesn't support units. And so that would be a future enhancement needed if we wanted to keep the units going all the way through the FFT. All right, so let's start with the simplest form of imagery construction, which is just gridding here. And so here I'm using an existing package that has a histogram in it because the most simple version of gridding where you just put every case space sample in its nearest Cartesian grid and everywhere, that's basically the same as a histogram. Uh, in statistics, a weighted histogram, right? Weighted by the case space data value. And sadly, the, the stat, stat package doesn't yet support um, complex numbers. So I had to separately do a histogram of the real and the imaginary parts. You can imagine why a statistics uh, package might not support complex numbers for the weights in a histogram, but we of course need that in MRI. So I have this workaround. I have a pull request in there to ask them to support complex numbers. We'll see if they, uh, uh, do that. And of course, when you just do that kind of uh, really crude nearest neighbor kind of gridding, let me just see what else. Okay, so I histogram the case-based data. 
and then I do an IFFT with appropriate FFT shifts. And so there I'm using something straight out of the FFT library. It's the same under the hoods, the same stuff you'd be using in MATLAB and presumably Python as well. And then I'm labeling it, uh, not in terms of pixels, but in terms of the pixel size in millimeters here. And it's a terrible reconstruction because that kind of nearest neighbor gridding works terrible. But that's, you know, ba there's basically really one line of code here, which is calling a histogram function with, it would have been one line if they supported complex data. Uh, by the way, this is, this is what the actual phantom looks like. So you can see we're not very close in reconstruction quality yet. So now let's get to non-uniform FFT approach to gridding. So for that, I need an NUFFT operator, or you could say I need an NF NUFFT function, but I would prefer to work with operators because once I get into iterative reconstruction, I want to do Y equals A times X, and I want to compute gradients by doing A transpose, A, a Hermitian transpose times blah, blah, blah. So that's what I've wrapped around this nfft.jl package, a, a NUFT operator, very similar to the, what would be GNUFFT in the, in the MERT MATLAB toolbox. And to have that operator, you need to specify your, your case space sampling. You need to specify your image size. Uh, and uh, usually in MRI, we want the coordinate system in the center of the image, not in the upper left-hand corner of the image, like is used in signal processing. So we need a shift that's uh, half the, half the image size. There are other options. Oh, by the way, anything after a semicolon in function calls here, those are op uh, options. Julia has very nice uh, named keyword arguments, which I kind of had to hack into MATLAB. Um, and, and so this is one of several named keyword arguments. And what this is creates is something called a, a linear map abstract operator that's of certain dimensions. It maps a 128 by 128 image into to 24,000 case space samples. Um, and, and that's what we need to go from Cartesian image space data to non Cartesian case space data. Now, for gridding, we actually want to go the other direction, right? And so I use the Hermitian transpose of that operator. So I take my data, um, turn it into a vector because that's what this expects is a vector. My original data I actually made as an array here back when I constructed it because it can be displayed as an array in polar coordinates. For something like a spiral, it wouldn't naturally be an array. It would just be a vector al already. And then I, the basic unweighted gridding reconstruction would just be take a transpose times that, which looks terrible because radial sampling is dense at the center of K space. So what we really need is density compensation if we want to do gridding properly uh, for non-Cartesian data. And so here, because I've done radial, I'm basically using a ramp filter. All right, so the absolute value of the radial sample uh, location in case space is a simplistic version of density compensation for radial sampling. Um, and so I would multiply, so dot times, just like you would have in MATLAB, I need to apply those density compensation factors element-wise times my data. Oh, actually, there's something that's happening. There's broadcast happening here. So this data is a 2D array, right? Number of radial samples by number of angular samples. The density compensation factors, that's a 1D array because we just have in, in if I'm just using a ramp filter, right? That's just 1D along the radial direction. So this dot times is actually telling Julia Julia and more recent versions of MATLAB can do that. Older versions couldn't. This is a 1D array dot times a 2D array, and it'll automatically broadcast to, to apply the radial uh, uh, density compensation to every uh, row or column of this data, whatever size matches appropriately. And then finally, we can do the adjoint of the NUFT operator to get a gridding reconstruction. Um, which looks better than the first version. It's still not quite right. Those of you who are familiar with this know that putting zero as the weight in the center of case space is not correct. And there's papers that talk about how to modify the density compensation at the center of case space. And so here, my radial samples are actually in millimeters. So I'm saying find the location where the radial samples is zero per millimeter, because there's units for this and then replace that value, this dot equals is like element-wise assignment with a, the area of the disk center, basically, so that we get a more appropriate weighting at the center of the center of uh, K-space. And then 
again, apply gridding reconstruction, and now you can see it's more reasonable quality. So um, <clears throat> I'll pause there for questions, because now I've illustrated kind of three different approaches to gridding reconstruction with NUFFT in Julia. Uh, and there's some profile plots to show the importance of correctly doing the ramp filter at DC. All right, let's move on to iterative reconstruction if there's no questions then. So let's, let's start with basic conjugate gradient where there's no regularizer, just a quadratic cost function that we'd like to solve. Um, so- and, and, uh, Jeff, sorry to interrupt. Just wanna say we have about five minutes. Left. Yeah, okay. We won't get through all the examples. So I created NUFFT, a compressed testing example, dynamic examples. I think you guys get the ideas now and you can, you can read this to yourself just as well as I can read it to you after this. So I will just probably finish the rest of this. Oh, should I be allowing time for questions, Jonathan? Was that part of the hint? I mean, take questions all along, but should I be allowing extra time? I, I think if people have questions, really encourage you just yeah. interrupt. So exactly. keep going. So you could, of course, write a special purpose conjugate rate algorithm just for this cost function, but I prefer code reusability. So I've written a general pur purpose co conjugate gradient function that can that can work with any cost function where you supply the gradient. That's what you need for the gradient, right? Uh, you also need something for the step sizes. So you need some curvatures to compute the step sizes. So the gradient, so this is a uh, least squares function that involves you know, ax minus y. And so at, at its heart, it's just this two norm and the gradient of that is just, if you take the gradient of that, it's just the argument minus y. Um, I've thrown in some scaling here. So anyway, this is basically U minus Y with some scaling to get the units correct. Um, the curvature of that function is one. My conjugate rating algorithm needs that. So finally, so this is overkill. I'm applying a nonlinear conjugate gradient algorithm, but this, this could use the ordinary conjugate gradient algorithm here. And I'm telling it to run 20 iterations. And as initial guess here, I'm using the most recent gridding reconstruction that I showed you, that fourth gridding example. Uh, and, you know, this is a function that I wrote. It's in the MERT version of Julia, and you could dig into it, look at all its options, but it's basically what you'd expect it needs. It needs the system matrix. It needs the gradient of the cost function. It needs a, something related to its curvature as well, for, which goes into the step sizes, and initial guess and number of iterations. And now you see a better image quality. Now, of course, we can get better image quality by including regularization. And so for that, I have, several of these, I have several different regularizers in the different examples. Here, I'm just using finite differences with an edge preserving potential function. So this is very similar to total variation, except I'm rounding the corner so that I can keep using diff, uh, conjugate gradient to keep it differentiable. And so here I'm actually uh, using Julia notation in math. So uh, you might write the one norm of t times x, but that wouldn't have the corner rounding. So this is, what this means is take the finite differences of the image X, apply a corner rounded one norm element wise to that array of finite differences, and then multiplying one transpose means add all those up. So if this function phi were the absolute value function, this would be a, a way of writing the one norm of T times X, but this is more general because I can replace the one norm with other potential functions. And in fact, I use something here called the fair potential function, which is a rounded version of the, of the uh, absolute value function. All right, so I need the matrix T or the operator T that does 2D finite differencing. So that's built into MERT. Left finite difference map, it needs to know the image size. It needs to know what dimensions you want to take differences along. So I want you know, horizontal and vertical differences. And it, in this case, since I'm dealing with complex data, I need to tell it the type. So I need to tell it I am going to be differentiating uh, complex data types. Um, so there are very similar operators in both MERT Torch and in the MATLAB version of these are the key ingredients you need to do iterative reconstruction. And here's what those finite differences look like for an image. Um, and this is the particular regularizer I'm using. I actually don't specify the potential function I, uh, itself. I specify what's called a weighting function, which is the derivative of the potential divided by its argument. And for the fair potential, that happens to be one plus one uh, over one plus its argument divided by delta. And so that looks roughly like a hyperbola, not exactly, but similar to hyperbola, corner rounded L1 function. 
uh, the, the weighting associated with that. The weighting is one at zero and then it decreases as you go away from zero. That's how you get the edge preserving. So now to apply nonlinear conjugate to this cost function, I need to tell it both about the system matrix A, the operator T, the least squares function, this, this potential function, all those ingredients are here. So both the gradient has both the data fit term and the potential function that goes with the uh, regularizer. Uh, the curvatures of those that I needed for line, step sizes. And then uh, this is a, an array that has the two system operators in it, the system matrix, the NUFFT, and the finite difference operator, the, the finite difference transformation. And then we call the NCG algorithm of that, and out comes an image that's the best quality of all of the results that I've shown you so far. And I think that is 301, so I will, uh, I will stop there at the end of that illustration. Thank you very much for your attention. Be happy to take more questions if the uh, symposium allows us to do that. Thank you. I uh, just want to re-emphasize that John put the link to this tutorial in the chat. And I was wondering, I mean, you had already given us an overview of the, you know, pros of Julia as kind of like synthesizing across different languages, this two language problem. Um, for someone who hasn't used Julia before, are there any cautionary tales or actually special tips to, you know, take most advantage of it that you would give. Oh, us oh okay. As I a thought closing asking, statement. I thought oh. we were going to ask about cons. Uh, let me see. Uh, that uh, too. Uh, just uh, pitfalls that I, we should be aware of to be most effective with it. Um, so the the most annoying thing about Julia, because it's compiled, we have what's called the time to first plot. The, the, the time when you first start a Julia session and you plot something, it actually has to compile the plotting routines, and so it's a little annoyingly long gotcha. to get your first plot. <laughs> But after that, it's fine, okay? Um, it is um, one-based. So if you're coming from MATLAB, it's very com comfortable. If you're coming from Python or C, you might be annoyed. Now, the, the reality is I actually very rarely write a loop that goes from one to anything. I iterate over a list of things. And, and so I, we do a lot, a lot of that kind of iterating. I think that comes from Python. I would really say, I wanna say this, Julie, I think has taken the best features of MATLAB and Python and put them together. Uh, and so, so things like general iterables, I'm pretty sure that comes from Python. And so I don't think that often really about whether it's one based or zero based, but for some people that's a showstopper. So I'll just say that out there. Um, but in fact, it, Julia does allow arbitrary array indexing. So for example, there's a package called FFFT views that you can wrap around the spectrum of a signal and then index it from minus N over two to N over two minus one, just like you would often want to do in signal processing. So you're not forced to use, it's one indexing by default, but you can uh, wrap or, uh, arrays it with other indexing, including zero indexing if you really want. Um, oh yes, uh, okay, this is another thing that annoys some people. There's no clear function because it's compiled. You can't undo that. So you have to, if you really screw something up, you might need to restart your Julia session. I don't have to do that very often, but but some some rarely, sometimes it's there. So for people who used to starting all over in MATLAB with Clear, can't do that in Julia. Um, so I think these were the main caveats. And this is from a previous, I gave a about one hour overview of Julian computational imaging. And there's a link to that talk on my website if you wanna learn more details about it. Okay. Yeah, let me ask a quick question. Yeah, because uh, you know the theme of this of this session was a lot on clinical recon. Ah, Do you yes. See this as being useful out of the box for clinical use. I think there's a ways to go there, right? I think this is, I, you know, maybe I'm biased because of who I am, but I think this is for developers at this point, really, people who want to develop new algorithms, to try them out. Now, because it's compiled, um, I think it could be that it could uh, fit nicely into some of those more integrated packages. In the long, I don't know anybody who's tried to do that yet. Uh, I have had students call go both ways. You can call MATLAB from, from Julia and you can call Julia from MATLAB. Uh, did I say this? You can call you can both ways and also with Python. And so I see no reason why in Gadgetron you couldn't pass an array to a compiled, basically compiled Julia routine, have it do its magic and return. But I haven't attempted any of those integrations myself yet. I think that's a great question uh, to, to ask. And, uh, um, I hope that as these tools that I and others are developing here, there'll be more opportunities to explore that. Great question. Any last minute questions from the audience? All right, well, 
let's go ahead and conclude the session. Thanks again, uh, Jeff and all the other speakers. I think it was a really great session. Um, and thank you, Audrey, for co-moderating. And uh, please check out all of the available resources and, and the recordings after the, the session. Thank you so much. Thanks, John. Bye-bye. Happy holidays.